Hello, my name's Sarah and I'm the project director here at the Mullaney Fund. Um, today I'm going to be delivering some training for our new mentors. Hopefully you're here because you've volunteered your services as a mentor on our Mullaney Mentoring Project. So the first thing obviously I need to say is a very big thank you. Um, I've been working with the programme for the last eight years and we do work some, with some amazing young people as well as our volunteer mentors. And I've seen firsthand the positive impact that an effective mentoring relationship can have on a young person. Um, without our fantastic volunteers like yourselves, it wouldn't be possible for us to support the young people that we do. So thank you very much. So to begin with, um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we do and who we are here at the Mullaney Fund. So you've got a bit of perspective about you and your role as a mentor on one of our projects. So the Mullaney Fund was established back in 2008 and our overall objective um, was and is to ensure that every young person is provided with the opportunity to access a career within the STEM sectors regardless of background. Through our projects we seek to directly challenge the barriers that many young people might face in accessing career and training routes in the STEM sectors by providing information, advice and guidance as well as positive role models such as yourselves and insights into potential professions. We engage with young people aged 14 to 19 across South Wales in all of our projects um, and currently we're working in eight local authority areas, but we've just opened up to young people across the whole of Wales. Um, we're very grateful to be supported in this through a variety of funders and this support makes sure that all our services remain completely free for schools and the young people who access them. So at the Mullaney Fund, all our work is founded on our four main aims. Um, first, to encourage awareness of the different careers within life sciences, healthcare and science professions. Second, to promote aspirations towards those professions. Third, to increase the motivation and confidence of our service users. And fourth, to expand our service users' knowledge and understanding of their options for employment and training routes into these careers. In order to achieve these aims, we run three distinct programmes of support. Millennium Mentoring, which is our main project and what our training is based on today. The Future Roots pro project, which is a limited scheme of work experience placements that we are able to offer young people through our partnerships with universities, GP practices, hospitals and other organisations. And then finally, our Insight Talks, where professionals provide in school or online talks sharing their experience and provide insights into specific careers and progression paths. Today we're focusing on the Mullaney e-mentoring project as this is the project program that you're supporting by volunteering your time as a mentor. So how does it work? Well initially students um, will complete a short online registration in which they outline their interests within life sciences or STEM subjects and this is then used to match them with a suitable mentor. So for example if a student is interested in nursing, we'll try and match them with a mentor who's a nurse or is studying to become one. Sometimes when demand is very high, we might not always be able to directly match a student based on their interests with a mentor. So it's perfectly possible you may get a student who's not directly seeking to progress within your specific career. But from experience, we know that this is OK and there's still a great deal of useful information <clears throat> and impact that can be had from the conversations during the session. Mentoring sessions will last um, from between eight to 10 weeks with three throughout the academic year. And each week students and mentors will receive recommended weekly themes of support designed to promote engagement and useful discussion. However, the topic of conversation and areas of support are really service user led and dependent on the direction the mentor and the student decide to take. All of our mentoring takes place on our secure bilingual online mentoring platform, Mentora, meaning you won't have to meet your student in person. And this really is just one example of how we ensure everybody's safety and well-being, which we'll go into later. Additionally, all messages that they send and you send are moderated through the site before being sent and no personal identifying information is exchanged between the mentor and the student. Again, this allows us to keep our mentors safe and our students safe while at the same time promoting the growth of useful conversations. Just an extra point responding to feedback from previous sessions, we've been asked if we could send out what a student mentor conversation would look like. Unfortunately, no student mentor conversation will look the same as everyone is different, um, but we would advise don't be nervous about this. If you take our tips into account and if your student wishes to and is able to engage, the session will go well. 
So we take um, measuring <coughs> our impact very seriously at the Maloney Fund. Um, and after each session, uh, we provide mentees with an exit questionnaire related to key performance indicators. And we also provide mentors with an exit questionnaire to look at any process issues. Um, I'm not going to go through the figures on the screen exactly, but over the last nine years of engagement, um, you can see um, that we've had a very real impact on those who've participated in the programme, and that's largely due to um, volunteer mentors like yourselves. Um, we've had about 1,800 people who've registered for the scheme. Um, we currently have a database of over 300 DBS checked um, mentors, over about 38 specialities at the moment. Um, and we can see that what all the volunteer mentors are doing in terms of support is really helping the young people involved. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about exactly what mentoring involves, the sort of support you can expect to offer our students and what makes for effective communication. As ever, if you have any questions during this hour, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. So on the screen now, we're getting examples of the qualities we look for in a mentor. Now, whilst I won't go through these in turn, especially as the list isn't an exhausted one, it's worth looking a little closer at one or two of these. For example, being positive and enthusiastic might seem obvious, but those qualities are absolutely key in developing an effective relationship with our students. Many of them will be encouraged to engage and be brave enough to ask questions. And so simple things like being enthusiastic and being positive will, will make, make a big impact. I've also included some qualities highlighted in red, which is important to remember that you're not. Despite many people assuming that they will be desirable for mentors to demonstrate, it's really important to remember that you're not a counsellor, confidant, friend or an expert. It's paramount that you as a mentor and the students are clear that you're not there to mentor them on mental health issues or to talk with expert detail on every possible topic of support. You're also not able to keep secrets or be their friend. We'll talk about this later and the importance of boundary setting, but establishing these at the start is vital to a successful mentoring relationship. It's really the classic friendly but not their friend approach. One of the best things about our mentoring project is that the students can shape the direction of their conversations and they may want support in a variety of areas. You can see on the screen some examples of the types of support most commonly discussed during every session. We don't expect you to be experts on everything, obviously, and each week we will send mentors a theme of support. So, for example, if you're mentoring a year nine student, we'll say that on this particular week, we think it will be good for you to discuss making the right GCSE options with them. We'll then provide mentors with online resources to help you talk knowledgeably about this. And we'll also send partnering resources to the young people to help them engage in meaningful conversations. That said, students may not want to talk about this, that specific area at that time. And much of the mentoring relationship will depend on your ability to adapt, but also to encourage students to discuss specific topics that you think will be useful for them. So it's really worth at an early stage giving thought to the students you'll be mentoring and to what some of their concerns, their challenges and their feelings might be. If you're mentoring an older student in sixth form, their concerns and around university applications, for example, securing work experience and upcoming exams may be top of their list. Whereas with younger students, a general uncertainty about what careers they're interested in and simply how to get into certain roles might be more on their mind. Our mentors are fantastic at adapting their approaches depending on the needs and age groups of the students they interact with. And we're there to support you with advice, resources and information should you need it at any point during a session. And this ability to adapt will be more important than ever in the current circumstances as students are likely to have new and developing concerns or questions that we can't yet anticipate. Rest assured that we continue to develop additional resources to help you support students with these and we are producing more resources and guidance as and when there are policy changes. It might sound obvious but communication is key to any mentoring relationship, never more so than when working with young people. Although it's impossible to provide too much training around communication in this session, there are a few important things to consider which will help you to ad adapt effective and positive communication with your student. Firstly, building rapport is essential. If possible, be the one to send the first message as this will show your engagement and enthusiasm. 
try to use friendly informal language and ask open questions. If you can show interest in what their interests are and talk more than just about your studies, then this will set you off well. Try to keep your messages succinct. Don't write essays as this can put some students off at the start. In your initial message, think of including questions which will help you to get to know them. We'll send out guidance on this later, but asking them about their future goals, their interests and what their favourite subjects are is always a good start. It's worth setting clear expectations in the first message also, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Simply try not to overload them with information at the start. Stay friendly and enthusiastic and it should go pretty well. So let's talk a little bit about setting expectations because doing so will help to structure the session and foster a positive and effective mentoring relationship. At the start, it'll be worth discussing how often your message per week. Students have been told that they have to send a minimum of one message per week and we also ask that mentors do the same. However, of course, most mentors and students will send many more than one message every week. It will be good to outline the type of support you'll be able to offer and give examples of areas and consider if it will be helpful to highlight a specific day each week that you'll be sending messages. At some point during the session, it's likely that you will need to help your students to set one or more multiple goals. It's also a really useful thing to do anyway at the start of any session, as this will allow you to help them progress throughout the eight to 10 weeks in achieving this goal. So if a student decides that their goal is, for example, to become a doctor, then try to deconstruct this goal into more manageable targets. You can focus on turning challenges into positive targets that can help them overcome their barriers. So for a student who wants to become a doctor, a good target would be to find some relevant work experience, which with no family or friend networks in this profession may have seemed impossible to some of our students before discussing it further. So I don't intend to go into too much detail about target setting, and of course you will have access to this training when it finishes today, but it's worth trying to make sure that when setting any targets with your students, that these targets are smart if at all possible. I'm sure most of you will understand what a smart target is, as you've probably gone through it in your studies, etc, etc. Uh, essentially, it's a way of ensuring that the target is structured and possible to achieve. So to reinforce what makes a smart target not a smart target, we've got two examples on the screen. As you can see, the first is I want to get some work experience next month by sending 12 placement applications off every week so that I can gain experience in my chosen career. It probably won't surprise you to know that this is not a smart target and essentially it's not a smart target because it's not specific enough. It's very general. What kind of work experience are they trying to get? And it's also not particularly achievable. It doesn't seem realistic to expect a child to make 12 applications every week. So that's not a smart target. The second one then, I want to finish my UCAS personal statement by the end of the mentoring project. I will aim to have sent my mentor two drafts for feedback. Again, it probably won't surprise you to know this is, is a smart target and it's a smart target because it ticks every box. It's specific enough. It's talking about writing a personal statement. It's measurable as we can judge whether they have written that personal statement. It seems realistic to expect them to have drafted two versions um, in the 10 week period of the session. It's obviously relevant to their long term goals and it's time based. So this is a smart target. Don't worry too much about some of the structure of your targeting, but when you're helping to set goals, obviously this will come in handy. And now we're going to move on to an important element of our training, safeguarding. And as with any project working with children and young people, safeguarding is our first priority. And as mentors, it will be your responsibility to help us to ensure the self safeguarding and well-being of all our users. All of you should have received a safeguarding guidance document which outlines the process you should take in the event of a safeguarding concern or incident. If you haven't received this, it's really important you let us know, so please do let me know at the end and we can resend the document. It's important to remember that our students represent a diverse group of people and each faces individual challenges and have very specific needs. Now, as mentors and staff at the charity, we must always consider the well-being of our students. And although it's unlikely you will face any issues, it is clearly better to be prepared. Your role is relatively simple as a mentor in this regard. You should stay vigilant, but don't panic or try to investigate too much. The Mullaney Fund has a designated safeguarding lead, myself, Sarah James, 
<clears throat> and you should inform me as soon as possible with any disclosures made to you by young people or any concerns you have. It's not your responsibility as a mentor to decide on whether a child's disclosure warrants a response. You must simply pass on the information. In order to ensure the well-being of our students and of course you as mentors, it's important that we think about boundaries and developing and maintaining them is really key to your conversations. Importantly, you should emphasise what you're there to support with and make it clear that the mentoring platform is where all communication should take place. We want to make it as easy as possible for our mentors and so we do have very clear positions on boundaries. They are that all contacts should be limited to the mentoring platform mentor only and will cease as soon as the session ends. That's not to say we can't send a message um, for you via email at the end of the session if you've missed the last week or something, but you won't have any direct contact after the mentoring um, session ends. We also say that no personal information at all should be communicated. So this includes telephone numbers, email addresses, photos, or other identifiable characteristics. There has been some confusion recently because um, We've had some mentors who've kindly wanted to set up work experience placements and wanted to pass on their personal email addresses um, to enable this to take place. We can't do this, I'm afraid, um, for anybody. Um, but if you would like to do this, we can pass on contact details for a work experience organisation to the student for you. Um, the platform only includes your first name. Um, for similar reasons um, and we also say that mentors should never connect or accept attempts to connect with students on social media platforms. Um, it's really as simple as that and ensures that everyone remains as safe as possible. As part of safeguarding we must consider abuse and indicators of abuse and although it's highly unlikely that you will be required to deal with any indicators of abuse it is helpful to be aware of its existence so that you can be vigilant for signs. Now there are many types of abuse and not all look like we might expect. Broadly abuse can fall into the following categories of domestic sexual neglect, online physical and emotional. But most relevant to you would be to consider some of the online indicators of abuse that you may well see in your inter interactions with young people. One of the first online indicators is an explicit disclosure where a young person directly says that they are being abused. Now this is the most unlikely type of indicator but it's something to be aware could happen. Other indicators of abuse can be where students are describing unhealthy relationships or unsuitable living conditions. They may talk about being isolated from friends or family or you may well see a dramatic change in the tone of their messages or a sudden disengagement from their studies or from goals they were really previously enthusiastic about. Now this list is designed as a guidance only and it's not exhaustive by any means. And it's also worth remembering that all messages are moderated so chances are if there's a type of abuse being indicated then we will have caught it already. So you won't have to worry too much about this but of course you should always be aware. So let's take a look at what your response should be if, for whatever reason, an explicit disclosure manages to get through the moderation system and you receive a message from a student in which they say they're being abused. Now, it is possible that in the first instance, they will have asked you to keep a secret. And on the screen and in the safeguarding guidance document, there's an outline of the process you should take in the event of a direct disclosure. Initially, keep calm and neutral and explain that you cannot keep a secret and that you will need to tell someone who can help them. This might put them off telling you, but it's important that you don't promise that you can keep it a secret. Next, remember that there's a record of the disclosure already as we retain all messages <coughs> sent on our chat space, so you don't need to worry about making additional notes. Remember not to ask any questions or make any judgmental statements. Simply reassure the student that they've done the right thing in telling you and that someone will now be able to help them. Finally, you need to contact the DSL at the Mullaney Fund as soon as possible with this information. If this occurs outside of business hours and you are particularly concerned, you can ring 999 or you can ring the NSPCC number that we've put on the screen shortly. <coughs> The DSL, with your information, will decide what actions to take and will advise you further. <clears throat> in the slightly more likely event that you develop a concern based on the student's behaviours, then the only thing you really need to do in this instance is contact the DSL as soon as possible and await for advice from us. 
So just to summarise the safeguarding points um, I've just made, um, your role in the programme is you're not a counsellor. Um, you must never give out any personal information, including um, your number or email addresses. Um, do limit all your contact to the mentoring platform during the session and never contact uh, with your student via social media. Do have a read of the safeguarding document after this session and ask us any questions um, if you have any. There is support available, although it's unlikely you're going to um, face any issues. Um, obviously, the first point is the platform moderation. Um, we also have our designated safeguarding lead and the safeguarding document, which you can refer to if you need to. Um, the DSL can be contacted during office hours. Also, in extreme circumstances, the NSPCC can be contacted outside of office hours if you have a concern and all the details are on the screen there. Um, just to wait, make a final point about confidentiality, um, to ensure the safety and well-being of students and mentors, um, the Mullaney Fund have access to all conversations and it's really important that you maintain your students' anonymity and you don't discuss the content of your conversations outside of the remit of this project. As a reminder, you'll have access to this training after the event, but contact details for the DSL and for the NSPCC out of hours hotline are now on the screen, and it's probably worth making a note of them somewhere so you can access them if you need to. So now that we've covered safeguarding and you hopefully anyway feel a little more informed about how we ensure safeguarding of our students, we can move on to familiarising ourselves with the new e-mentoring space that we've developed. So we're very excited to have recently completed the development of our own in-house bilingual e-mentoring space, Mentora. All of our mentoring takes place on this secure cure platform, which is managed by the Mullaney Fund. It's a relatively new development. We piloted it um, in the summer of 2022, so it's been around for about a year and we've made changes in relation to feedback. But please, please do tell us about any problems because some are popping up occasionally as soon as possible and um, preferably by email. So how do I join Mentora Mullaney? Um, you're able to download the Mentora Mullaney app from either Apple App Store or Google Play sites. But if you prefer to work on a desktop or laptop, you can use the link that's on the screen. All mentors will have set up a Mullaney Fund account when they registered as a mentor using an email and password. And you should use this email and password to sign into the Mullaney Fund mentoring space. And then you'll be automatically matched with your student or students on the platform ready to chat. It's as simple as that. So on the screen now, you can see the various channels that you will see once you've logged into Mentora. Um, the first one is uh, Mullaney Notifications, uh, and this is where you can read weekly information and access any resources um, that are sent out by the Mullaney Communication Officer to support what you're doing. Um, the second channel, Admin Assistance. This is a route to ask any questions to the project communication officer and you'll also receive your responses to any questions you've asked here. Um, below this, you can see that this particular mentor has two students, Kian Shoned and Jemima. Um, you click on the name of your student here to access the chat space. Um, and obviously you click on the name of the one you want to talk to and write the message in there. Um, please note that you will get both email and notifications via the app if you're using it when you receive a message from your student or from admin. So you should be kept up to date um, in terms of their communication. We've tried to anticipate questions and answers about using um, Mentor and Mullaney. Um, and we've put them all on our website and they can be accessed at the address on the screen now. But if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch. So I've talked a little bit um, previously about our moderation system, which is in place for safeguarding reasons. And I'm going to go into it in a little bit more detail here. Um, for safeguarding reasons, all the messages you send your student will go through an automated filter before they're sent to your student. Certain words or symbols or numbers will flag up uh, to administrators as risky. So if your message contains one of these words, the Mullaney team will need to review it before it's sent to your students. Common and usually non-problematic examples in English and Welsh include um, meet or email or at hotmail, etc. for an email address or mental. 
um, and swear words in both English and Welsh will obviously also be stopped, as will telephone numbers. All attachments will enter into moderation as well as all links, just so we can check them over and, and check there's nothing which is going to cause a problem. Just to say, though, um, it really is impossible for you to guess um, all the words which might cause a message to enter moderation, as the list is very, very long. So please, please don't worry too much about it. The admin team put through non-problematic messages to your students really as soon as possible. Um, and obviously you will be informed if your message needs to be modified. Um, although the admin team do have the power to modify your original message, i.e. take out a telephone number to speed things up a little bit. Please don't worry also if you put something in which ultimately um, you just forget that you shouldn't do, um, you shouldn't, shouldn't have done because um, everybody does that. We're all very busy and um, uh, our minds wander sometimes. So please don't worry about that. Um, we'll sort it out as quickly as possible. So as I said, as soon as you have a chance, please do log into the platform so that you have time to explore it before the students start engaging with you. But now, talking of that, we're going to discuss a little bit more about engagement and what to expect from our students. As a mentor, it's really helpful to remember that not every student is the same and the nature of their age and the fact that they will often have many other commitments mean that not all of them will immediately engage with the mentoring when the session first starts. <clears throat> now, we do ask that students and mentors send each other a minimum of one message per week, but that doesn't always happen. And it's actually often very likely that you'll send many more. But this is the minimum that we're working towards. It's perfectly possible that you may not receive um, a, a response to your message in the first week from a student and it's really important actually not to be afraid to send a follow up message. Our students can sometimes be very distracted. They've got a lot going on in their lives and so if they see a follow up message from you, then this can often be the prompt they need to respond and start engaging with the project. At the Mullaney Fund, we're very keen to ensure that there is as much engagement as possible, obviously, and so we do monitor engagement across the platform. Every week, Millennium Fund staff will work with school staff. We send them engagement reports of who from their school have sent messages and who haven't. Equally, you can see if a student has sent a message and a mentor hasn't responded. Now, we understand that you can be very busy, but if that message goes days without a response, it can be quite off-putting and disheartening for the student. So you may well get a message from a Millennium Fund staff member just saying, oh, by the way, we're not sure if you've seen this, but there's a message from your student. Could you possibly respond when you have a spare five minutes? Of course, if you've got any problems or concerns with engagement, then absolutely contact us through the support channel so that we can give you some advice and guidance if at all possible. There are some common problems. Sometimes students simply don't respond. They sign up, they log in, and then they decide they just don't want to do it. This happens rarely, but it does happen, and it obviously can be quite disheartening for a mentor because we know that you've given up your time and are eager to engage with a young person. And it can be quite frustrating it's really nothing that you have done. It just sometimes happens. <clears throat> Similarly, and probably equally disheartening, sometimes students respond with very short messages. This tends to be because they're quite shy. It tends to be because they don't know how to interact with someone who's older than them and who is in a profession they might know very little about. It's OK to encourage them to ask them more open questions, to send a couple of longer messages back and only receive short messages in return. It's nothing you're doing wrong. It's only that sometimes some students take a while to fully engage with our project. And they are almost certainly still getting a great deal of benefit from your interaction, regardless of how short their messages are. Thankfully, engagement across the board seems to be really good. And it's normally a really rewarding relationship for both student and mentor. <clears throat> As I said, sometimes it's possible the student doesn't engage in the way we would like. And if you've ever got any concerns about that or queries about how you can engage them further, then please do contact us because we're very used to these sorts of questions and can often do something and provide some advice to help you out. We're now coming to the end of the training session for today, so I hope you found it useful. Appearing on the screen, we've got some important do's and don'ts for the project. I don't intend to go through each one. You can do that for yourself. But essentially, please make sure that you take the initiative and enthusiastically engage with your students to promote useful conversations. Your experiences will be hugely beneficial and inspirational to our young people, so don't be afraid to use them. 
Even if you're talking to a student who isn't directly looking to progress in the career that is yours, you can still be incredibly inspiring and promote aspirations and confidence within that person. Log in and keep contact regular and consistent and always make use of the support channels should you need to talk to us. Remember never to divulge any personal details, to always be aware of safeguarding and try not to expect lengthy prose by way of response to your questions. We are, after all, dealing with teenagers. We know that mentoring has a very real impact on the young people who use our services and we are so grateful for the time and effort that each and every one of our mentors contributes to our project. Without you, your experiences and inspiring journeys, we simply wouldn't be able to improve aspirations, raise awareness and increase the confidence of young people we work with. So a massive thank you from all of us at the Maloney Fund and we hope you enjoy it as much as previous mentors have. So that's the end of the training session. Please do feel free to exit the window now if you have no further questions. But if anyone does, just turn your mic on and ask away. Thank you. Enjoy the mentoring session and the best of luck.